is Peggy Curtis, and I'm representing the community seniors of Bolton, Huntington, and Richmond. And this is one of our um, programs that we're sponsoring, and we're welcoming Spencer Hardy, um, a Vermont boy, <laughs> <laughs> who is a naturalist and biologist, and he studied um, among, among insects, bees, also fish and birds and other things, I believe. Um, we're very anxious to hear what he has to say. He's been working for, uh, he is, was the coordinator for the Vermont Wild Bee Atlas uh, through the, um, the uh, Vermont Center for Eco Studies, and he'll tell us more about that, I'm sure. So um, welcome, Spencer. Um. Thanks for having me. Is this on? Can you guys hear me right? Cool. Uh, yeah, so I, I work for the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. We're a fairly small conservation nonprofit based out of the White River Junction area. Um, I've been focused on bees for the last four or five years, really trying to understand what's going on with our wild bee populations. We've, we've all heard a lot in the news about the insect apocalypse and the decline of bees and um, what that might mean for our food systems and for our ecosystems. So I'm gonna sort of introduce bees and then walk you through a little bit of what we've done over the past five years uh, and then what we can do going forward to keep healthy bee populations around in our yards and in our communities. Um, but we're gonna start with a little game. Feel free to jump in if, um, if you think this is a bee or not. Yes. <laughs> Started off with an easy one. We're all moderately familiar with bees. Bumblebees are, are the most sort of charismatic, the megafauna of the bee world, if you will. Um, this is a distinctive uh, bumblebee, the tricolored bumblebee that um, many of you probably have in your backyards at some point over the summer. They're still flying on the, these last few warm days. I've seen a few males. Uh, they won't be out for much longer. Another fuzzy one. Anyone want to take a guess if this is a bee or not? Maybe. It's <laughs> a good guess. <laughs> this is a, a bee mimicking robber fly. So a, that's a robber fly. So it's a fly that's pretending to be a bee so that it either doesn't get eaten or that it can sneak up on other bees. These guys will actually eat um, smaller bees. How about these? Honeybees. Look a lot like honeybees, don't they? <laughs> Somebody else thought they were honeybees, but these are in fact um, drone flies. So they're, they're oh mimicking honeybees. Um, <laughs> it's, they only have uh, two sets of wings, and their antenna are a little different. They've got really short antenna characteristic of the flies, whereas most of the bees have longer, uh, straighter antenna. There's a few other differences, but um, the point being that they're very good mimics. Are those in Vermont? <laughs> These are in Vermont, yeah. I, for I forget where this picture was taken, but I think it was locally. Uh, and this guy that identified it, he's, he's the world bee expert. Um, and it, he was going too fast, and he's fooled him. So they're probably pretty good at fooling birds and spiders. Um, all right, how about this one? This is getting off the beaten path a little bit. <laughs> so this is, this is a bee, one of our smaller bees, the eastern fur, a furrowed cuckoo bee. Um, chances are you've never seen this or heard of it, but it's, it's in a, some yards, um, especially where there's been recent construction projects. I'll find them in like really low growing yard vegetation. Um, not super common, but they're present. I found them in Richmond before. Black and yellow stripes must be a bee, right? <laughs> this is another fly mimic. A hornet fly, so it's mimicking a hornet. <laughs> um, let's see what's next. Oh, just no, look at the eyes on this one. These, the eyes are really complex with a lot of different colors. That's something you'll never see in a bee. Um, that's a characteristic of, of this group of flies. 
the eyes are all uniform colored. So I, I, um, they don't have they're they're not they don't have the weird spirally swirls. I spoke too soon. What is it? This is the we're getting towards the end. Anyone want to guess on this one? This is a pretty distinctive species. That's in it's quite common across Vermont and the Northeast. This is our striped sweat bee, the bicolored striped sweat bee, which goes to show that bees can come in a lot of different colors and sizes and shapes. Um, and I think this is the la this is the last one. <laughs> Anyone want to guess? This is a talk about bees, after all. This is what bees look like for at least what this bee looks like for 11 months out of the year. So this is the larval stage of the squash longhorn cuckoo bee. Um, so during the summer, during a few months in July and August. This looks like a, a, a black and white fuzzy bee wasp kind of critter, um, but it spends most of its life as this uh, larva underground in a nest eating pollen and a little bit of nectar that's been stored by its, its mother. This is a ground nesting species. Um, most of our bees are ground nesting, and I'll get to that in a little bit, but not all of them. Um, all right, so now that you're a little bit confused, and we can start back up a little bit, and we can talk about what bees really are. Um, they are, in fact, a monophyletic group, so they're a distinct taxonomic group, unlike wasps, which sort of are, are a bigger taxonomic group that includes some things that we don't think of as wasps. So um, wasp people like to call bees vegetarian wasps because they fit under the larger umbrella of wasps. Um, and the vegetarian part is actually quite important, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, so bees, it's this EPA family, it's kind of an obscure taxonomic group, but it includes uh, six, seven families, six of which are in North America. We have representatives of all the North American families in Vermont. Um, and families are they're defined by some like obscure mouth part features, so it's not a really useful uh, field mark, or it's not, often not a very useful um, separating taxonomic level. I often just go right to the genus, and that's where there's a lot, where there's more discrete differences, although um, with exceptions, of course. Um, this is one of our fairy bees, one of our smallest bees. Um, but why do we care about bees more than flies or wasps? And I mean, part of that's probably a little bit misguided, but also it's they're a source of honey, which I'll talk about at the end of the talk, and maybe not until then. Um, but the important thing about bees that makes them so important as pollinators are these hairs, and they're, they're branched hairs, um, which all bees have somewhere on their body, which is sort of the defining feature of this EPA family. These like basically split ends. Uh, and if you look closely here, it may not from the back, maybe hard to see, but this is a honeybee feeding on an almond flower, and as she's grabbing, she's going for the nectar, she's, her hairs are collecting pollen grains from the flower, and then carrying them on either on her legs or on her back to the next flower she visits where she'll pollinate it. So these branched hairs are really designed to collect pollen, and then, uh, which makes them more efficient pollinators for most, but not all, flowering plants. Um, and the, the vegetarian part is that they are feeding their offspring exclusively pollen as opposed to other protein sources. So developing larvae of any organism uh, require a high proportion of protein in their diet. Uh, wasps do it through caterpillars or um, other insects that they're parasitizing, uh, other, other sources of protein, whereas bees are, are somewhat unique in that they use pollen as the primary protein source, as the in entire protein source for their developing offspring. Um, Nectar is the other thing that bees and other insects get from flowers, which is, which is sugar, basically. And the pollen is the, is the protein that they develop their offspring off of. And they have these hairs to collect the pollen to bring it back to their nest. But you see, I mean, I, I notice, and I have a small garden behind my house, and I get a fair amount of um, bumblebees, not a lot, which is kind of dumb. But I also see wasps doing what looks like bumblebees do. Yeah. I mean, they're going over the flowers. They're digging down into them. They're getting the nectar. Are so, they, are they, what are they doing? 
the question was about what are wasps doing on flowers when they're mixed in with acting like bees. Um, and they, they're doing one of two or three things. They're probably getting nectar for themselves as like a fast food sugar energy boost. They, I don't know if it's true. Some, some flies and maybe some wasps are eating pollen for themselves. They're not collecting it for their offspring, but they're, they're eating the pollen. And then a lot of the wasps we see on flowers are actually predatory, looking for other flower visiting insects to eat. Um, but if they're, if they're in the flower, sort of like acting like a bee, they're probably going for the nectar as a sugar source. And they're just doing that for themselves. Like for themselves. And then they're, they're using that sugar to go find protein to bring back to their nest. Honeybees are, again, a little different, and we can talk about them later. But I'm going to intentionally not talk about them for a bit. All right. So um, what I've been working on for the past four or five years is, is understanding the wild bee fauna of Vermont. Uh, we, didn't really, we didn't have a list when we started this project. We really had no idea what was here. Um, we had some other states to compare to. There's some national resources, but it's kind of the wild west of natural history. Um, entomology in general is I mean, often overlooked, but we really didn't know mo much of what was going on about bees in Vermont. We had done some work on bumblebees uh, in the early 2000, in the, like 2010, 11, 12, um, but the rest of the bees, which is the vast majority of the species, we really had no idea what was here, how their populations were doing, where they were, what they needed for um, habitat requirements, phenology, all these, all, tons of questions, very few answers. Um, we now know there's roughly, all six families are in Vermont, um, 39 plus or minus genera, 350, 353 species, although that number changes um, annually, and we'll probably never have a concrete number, but it's, it's sort of plateaued around 350 species, uh, um, maybe 75 of which we've documented for the first time in the last four years. And then um, there's some non-native species. That number is probably going to increase over time. Species brought in from Europe or from Asia accidentally or intentionally in the case of the um, European honeybee. And then most are ground nesting, but roughly 12% nest in above ground cavities. Um, holes in uh, rotten logs, um, pithy stems of goldenrods and sumacs. Um, any, any kind of above ground cavity is fair game. There's even one species that nests in snail shells. Haven't found it in Vermont yet, but it, it may be here. Um, the, mo the majority are in the ground. And then there's, with, other than nesting, there's a lot of variation in natural history as well. So we have what we call specialist bees, um, things like this one here. This is um, the geranium miner. So it only eats the pollen and nectar of wild geranium little pink flower that's sort of at the northern edge of its range in the Champlain Valley, maybe in Richmond as well. But the only place you'll ever find that bee is in northern hardwood forests in mid-May, late May, when the geranium are flowering. The adults are active for maybe a month, and then they spend the, the, that generation dies. The next generation spends 10 or 11 months underground eating that geranium pollen that its mother collected. The next spring, they emerge. At, hopefully at the same time that the geraniums start blooming and they repeat the cycle. Um, geranium specialist, we've got an aster specialist that's maybe still flying right now, um, a sunflower specialist, some willow specialists. There's like 25% of the species that we know of in Vermont are these specialists that have fairly narrow diets. Um, some more narrow than others. There's, for example, there's maybe a half dozen species that are, we call willow specialists that use a variety of willows, but there's one or two that are, um, appear to be sandbar willow specialists, so they're only using one species of willow, um, which bloom, happens to bloom a little later in the season. But. And then there's some that are using like all of the goldenrod, aster, sunflowers family, and there's some that are only using one or two species of aster or goldenrod. Um, Take a few questions now before we move on. Has Vermont seen this, it was in the news a lot in, in recent years, not so much very recently, this very aggressive African honeybee, do you know the one I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, so the question was about Africanized honeybees. Um, I don't believe they're in Vermont. They, I think they're, they're still much further south. 
warmer areas. But I don't think we want them either. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A question. Uh, yeah. What we normally think of as honeybees, Italian honeybees, is there anything that they don't like? I mean, do they? Good, because they're getting nectar and right. throughout the whole right. summer. Right. Um, questions about the diet of, of European honeybees, the cultivated, the domesticated honeybees. Um, and no, you're, you're correct. They are a generalist. So they, they visit a little bit of everything from April through October. Um, and anything that's active for the whole summer tends to be a generalist because there, any one plant's not likely to be blooming for the whole season. Um, so that some like the bumblebees are, are all generalists for the most part. Um, some of these metallic sweat bees are, are generalists. So they're, they're visiting a variety of different things for their pollen and nectar needs, depending on what happens to be blooming. Um, so talked about this a little bit, but for the three years we went around the state. We also went to museum collections. So we went to UVM and Middlebury and some of the other places we thought there might be insects into the basements and dug through the drawers and found any bee that had a label with a date and location that was collected in Vermont. Um, so that's really all we know about bees in Vermont prior to like 2000, 2010, is these pieces of paper that were with a, a bee pinned to them in the basements of universities and some private collections um, across Vermont and we got some data from other uh, museums around the country. But you can see this is uh, the number of species recorded per year from 1800 to like 2020. 2020, I think. Um, very, very, there's one record from uh, 1850, I think, but basically no records until like the 60s and 70s we start getting, I don't know, what is that, uh, 50 species a year that we have a, a single record of. Um, and now we're, we're, the last few years we've been finding one, or, one to 300 species a year. Um, so we really don't have any historical data, very little historical data, which makes it hard to know what's, what's happening. So we, don't, we can't say that like the bald eagle is a great example. We, we know there were bald eagles here, then there weren't, and now there are again. But if we didn't have any data prior to 2000, we'd say there's bald eagles here, and that's kind of where we're at with, with, um, with bees. But we do have records from all but two towns over, and then in the last few years, we have records from 330 of the 350 plus species. So almost all of the species that have ever been recorded in Vermont have also been found in the last few years which is, a, I suppose, an encouraging sign. Um, and I think we're almost up to like, yeah, 65,000 records where we have a date, location, and a bee species within the state of Vermont. Some of those are from community scientists like in the audience here. Some of them are from this project. Some of them are from museums. It's a variety of different places. Um, I mentioned briefly the Vermont Bumblebee Atlas. This was sort of a, a, a smaller project targeting just the 13 or 16 species of bumblebees that we knew of in Vermont, um, 2012, I suppose. And we found, it, it showed some uh, concerning trends, which is sort of where the ball got rolling to look at the, the rest of the bees. Um, same general protocol, we went around the state, collected a bunch of bees, compared that to what we found in museum collections. Uh, and some, so the historic museum collections are these dark bars and the um, post-2000 records are the, are the pale bars. And it's, it's, it's a relative abundance of all the bumblebees, how many of which each species. So the, the top one there, the Bombus impatiens, the common eastern bumblebee, was abundant in both periods. It's a little bit more abundant now than it used to be as a relative abundance. But the next one, the um, great northern bumblebee, I think is the common name, Bombus fervidus, used to be very common prior to 2000 very few records post 2000. Bombus affinis was the third most abundant species prior to 2000. There are no records post 2000. This is the rusty patch bumblebee that some of you might have heard of. Uh, it's federally endangered now. It used to be widespread throughout the Northeast um, and now is limited to some small cities in the Midwest for some reason. And I think they just found some in West Virginia. Um, so its, it's range has shrunk drastically in the last like 25 years, starting in the late 1990s. But you can see, so this goes to show there's, there's been some changes. There's been a few species that have disappeared. Um, some species are doing really well as a relative abundance. Um, and it's in the next few years, hopefully we'll be able to have an, another 
20 year update to see how things have changed in the last 20 years, because we have much better data since 2000. Yes? Are those extinctions related to the narrow food source that some of those had on the prior slide? So, question about um, whether the extinctions are correlated with the, di the diet breadth of these bumblebees. And um, probably not, because the bumblebees are all generalists in a sense because they're active for the whole season. All the bumblebees are active more or less for the whole summer. Um, so they're using a variety of different things. There are some differences within the bumblebee species as to what they're using. And there's some thought that habitat loss in, in old hay fields was a reason that, of decline for a couple of these species. Um, but the most likely culprit for the major extinctions is a, um, a gut parasite that came over with commercially, commercial bumblebees um, that they, from Europe in the late 1990s, early 1990s maybe. Um, I won't talk about that more for the sake of time now, but if you have questions about that, we can dive into that afterwards. Uh, fascinating story. Um, another, so bumblebees are this big fuzzy generalist that we see the queens in the spring, we see the workers throughout the summer. Right now it's males and there's a few queens that are coming out mating and then they'll start next year's populations. Um, and they're these generalists, they're moderately well known, and they're semi-social, so they, or they're, they're, they are social. They have uh, colonies with multiple caste differentiation within the colony. So there's sisters and there's these, what are these workers. Um, but then the rest of the bees, or the vast majority of the rest of the bees are solitary. So it's a male and a female. They mate, a female builds a nest, fills the nest with pollen, and then she dies and she'll never meet her offspring. And her offspring will develop on the pollen that she collected and they'll emerge six months to a year later. Um, maybe two years in a couple um, rare cases. But this is an example of one of these specialist solitary bees. It's an aster specialist, it's active August, September. And it built, uh, this picture was taken in my driveway at a previous apartment. Uh, they were huge nesting aggregation. I was, all fall, I'd watch them coming and going. And I started to wonder like what was happening underneath the ground. And if I was if driving over them, I had to, it was right where I parked. And if parking on them was causing a problem and how that, and I was, they came back the next year, so I figured it was okay. And then uh, last year, this paper came out looking at this, someone had found this species and they'd excavated an entire nest. And they found that the nest chamber went down three feet so the egg and the pollen was being laid like a meter under the surface of the driveway, there, at least in this case. Um, so I, I don't have to worry as much about the driving over them, I suppose. <laughs> but it, it comes into play with the substrate that they're using to nest in, which I'll talk about later. But sandy soils, this driveway happened to be at the edge of a sandy bluff, much easier to dig than a hard clay um, or even a clay loam. So yes, yeah, so that, that that's that one, the uh, northern aster, collecting aster pollen. And then also in that same driveway with these other species, these two other species, um, the nomad or the nomad cuckoo, Banks, um, Nomata banksii, is a, what we call a kleptoparasitic bee. So for any bird people in the audience, think of cowbirds. These are the birds that take, uh, bees that take over the nest of another bee they lay their eggs in that nest and they don't do any pollen collecting themselves. So they're, they're just, their offspring are, are stealing the pollen that was collected by their host species. Um, so these two species are totally unrelated, very different um, natural history taxonomy, but they're both parasites of that northern aster mining bee. So both of these bees were cruising around the same driveway looking for a place, to, looking for nests that they could sneak in and lay an egg. Um, and yet somehow the, the northern aster miner managed to have an, enough nests that weren't parasitized that they came back the next year. And I assume they're there right now. Um, almost 25% of our native species are parasitic. So it's a really diverse group. There's representatives in a couple different families parasitizing a lot of different species. How many are, eggs are they laying at a time in a, in a given nest? I believe it's one egg per nest. Um, so the most solitary bees, they, they build a, like a loaf of pollen, um, sort of bee-shaped like a tic-tac, and they lay an egg on that. And one, one loaf, one egg a day is kind of, 
in good conditions is what people think they can produce. And then they make, they make a little divider and they make another loaf the next day and another loaf. Um, and then I, these guys are trying to lay an egg on each loaf as it's being laid or right before it's being laid. Um, that was just a fun series of, this is a different nomad species parasitizing a different um, mining bee. So the, uh, if you can't see it, this is the mining bee on its way into the nest with legs full of pollen. So that white stuff is pollen that she's collecting and going down her hole to, to make that loaf with. And then this is the, the nomad that's watching. <laughs> she disappears and then the um, cuckoo goes down the hole. And then, um, to make things more interesting and uh, dangerous if you're a bee, there's, there's these parasitic bees and then there's a whole host of other insects and um, arachnids and probably birds that are making their living off of bees at the, at the expense of our solitary native bees. Bees are, they're herbivores, like I said, they're vegetarians um, and they really form the base of a pretty massive unexpected food chain um, that you can see in a lot of these species in our, that are in backyards and parks around the state. Um, so start, this is the, the bee wolf. It's a wasp that like, flies around flowers looking for bees, grabbing small bees that are slightly smaller than it, paralyzing them and dragging them back to its nest. So it'll, the, its larvae develop eating bees as opposed to eating pollen. Um, pretty common sandy soils. This is a bumblebee with some mites on its back. Uh, I don't know the species of mite. I don't know the, what's going on there. They might be quasi-beneficial in that they're eating bacteria and cleaning the nest and they're moving from nest to nest. They might be sucking the fluids out of it. I, I really don't know. Um, it could, be, could go either way. But I, I find a lot of specimens that have mites on them in one place or another. Uh, this is a crab spider that's holding the neck of a um, hairy banded mining bee. It's a goldenrod specimen. Both the crab spider and the Bumblebee or, or the bee are often found on goldenrod, the yellow camouflage. That's a pretty common occurrence where you find a bee or a fly or a moth hanging motionless below a flower. And if you look closely, it's almost always one of these crab spiders that's holding it by the neck. This is probably the craziest one that um, takes a minute to understand. So it's a, it's a mining bee visiting a spring beauty flower. And inside the abdomen of the mining bee, this is the, I think this is the head that's sticking out between the abdominal segments of this bee. The bee is perfectly alive, um, but there's this other organism called a twisted winged insect. It's an order somewhere near the beetles that is kind of mysterious uh, taxonomically, but they spend their entire adult life inside of other insects. So this thing crawled in there as a like tiny, tiny larva crawled in between the segments. Um, Develop and like has been growing inside of this bee's abdomen, and I, I think I think this has to be a, this is a female, and at some point, the males emerge from other other bees. The males have wings. They mate with the female in, that's sticking out of another bee, and then the female lays eggs or releases these little larvae that go infest the next bee. And there there's almost a lot of them are species specific. So whatever this this um, twisted wing insect is only found in that species of mining bee. And it has to, to reproduce, it has to find another of that species of mining bee and figure out and crawl inside of it. Um, kind of crazy and, and pretty rare, but I, I mean, maybe one in a thousand specimens has one of these living inside of it. They show up in photos from time to time. Um, the, uh, the bee fly, these are, pretty common early in the spring. There's a lot of different bee flies, but uh, the, these fuzzy ones I, I see in the spring cruising over nesting areas where there's ground nesting bees and the females will lay eggs and then they'll kick them into the nest of like the opening of the hole of their host bee. And then the, the egg develops eating either the larva or the food that's inside the nest. Um, and then this last one, the thick headed flies. These are a uh, mid to late summer parasite, I think mostly of bumblebees. Um, where they, they wait in near a patch of flowers, they see a bumblebee coming through, they fly out, they land on the back of the bumblebee, and they have a little thing on their abdomen they use to open up the abdominal segments and they lay an egg 
inside the abdomen of the bumblebee. Um, and then that egg goes about developing. It, do, it doesn't seem to have any negative effect on the lifespan of the bumblebee. So mostly bumblebee workers, the little ones, uh, and they're, they're developing in there. And then right before the bumblebee that would die naturally, there's something that the, this fly does to signal to the bumblebee that it needs to bury itself in the ground. So it, it, instead of dying on the surface, it, they bury themselves in the ground. And then that's where the fly pupates and, emerge, and I think emerges probably the next year. Um, these, these guys are really common. I see them on a lot of flower patches, sort of July, August. Um, it's a tough world for a bee out there. All right, so honeybees, which get most of the attention. Um, they are sort of the canary in the coal mine in a way, um, but they really are, at least in North America, they're an agricultural animal. I think of honeybees are to wild bees as chickens are to wild birds. So we're interrupting this bird talk to talk about chickens for a little while because that's what the media talks about and that's what people know and there's some, there's some cool tidbits in there. Um, but it, it, it's easy to conflate honeybees and wild bees and I encourage you to keep them sort of separate um, in your head. They're, they're, honeybees are a European species from Eastern Europe, Western Asia that have been domesticated for thousands of years. They've probably been in Vermont as long as uh, Europeans have been here. Um, they're not going anywhere, obviously, uh, but they primarily, in Vermont at least, exist in hives that people have in their backyards uh, or on their farm or they move them into the woods. Um, the decline of honeybees gets a lot of attention. It's, there's, there's validity to it. I will just point out here that the, according to the USDA, the number of honeybee hives um, in North America has increased in the previous decade. Um, so that's the, that's the orange bars. And that, that's just because we're really good at multiplying them. So if you want more honeybees, you call up somebody and they send you a box of honeybees and you have a new hive. Um, what's the other part of this figure though is those little hexagons with a number inside of them. That's the pounds per honey of hive per year. And that's gone down over the same time period, which is an indication that there's some serious health issues to honeybees and survival rates are lower, productivity is lower, um, and there's some problems there. And that, that's where all of this concern has come from. And it's from beekeepers that have having a much harder time keeping their colonies alive um, in the past couple uh, decades. And then, I, I don't, oh yeah, so here, this, um, this little blob in the corner is the varroa mite that beekeepers are very familiar with. Um, it infests the hive. It's a, I think it's a European or an Asian species that arrived in the uh, U.S. in the last century at least and has been um, making it really hard for unmanaged honeybee hives to survive. It, makes, it means much more management needs to happen to keep the honeybee colony healthy and alive through the winter. Um, and I don't think they escape much into the wild, into other wild bees. But they, do, they are a vector for viruses and pathogens between honeybee hives, which has um, probably led to this increase to um, health issues with honeybees. Um, map on the left is showing all of the registered honeybee hives in like, I think it was 2021. Basically, two thir three quarters of Vermont has registered honeybees somewhere in the surrounding landscape, within four kilometers, I think was where, which is sort of the foraging range of a, a honeybee. So they'll go three or four kilometers from a hive which, and cover almost all of Vermont. Um, the places where they're not are the places in white, which is the spine of the Green Mountains and really the Northeast Kingdom. Um, so almost anywhere people are likely to be in Vermont, there's, there's honeybees. How they interact with the wild bees, I think is a really interesting question that uh, with a lot of nuance and sort of beyond my understanding. There's a lot there that I haven't totally figured out. Um, and it sort of is an open scientific inquiry. This is just one example that I, I do think is pretty rare, but it, it, it's pretty fascinating. There's a friend of mine, I think in Illinois, took this series. It's a honeybee that's actually taking the pollen off of the legs of a bumblebee. So the bumblebee's collecting pollen from a thistle, and this honeybee comes in and is just taking the pollen. <laughs> 
I think this happened in a really dry summer. Um, so, and there's like one or two other documented occurrences of this in the literature. So it's probably not a, a common occurrence, but um, may happen in landscapes that don't have a lot of flowers, where they're, they're all competing for a small, limited resource pile. Which, I guess, is to the credit of beekeepers and to uh, the honeybee community and, and to the, the, out, the public um, media that's been out there about honeybees. The things that benefit honeybees, sort of the landscape level, the flowers and the reducing insecticides and um, general things I'll talk about in a little bit, but things that benefit honeybees tend to also benefit wild bees. So the more flowers are on the landscape, the more of both that the landscape can support. And the easier and the healthier the honeybee hives are likely to be. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. Collecting honey. They're making honey. Um, no, honeybees are honeybees are really distinct from all of our native species. Um, there, it's one species. There's, there's four species of honeybees in the world, I think. The western honeybee, Apis mellifera, is the only one that's been domesticated to any large extent, and it's the source of all of the commercial honey in the in the world. Um, and there are these big hives where they've got 100,000 individuals that are active all year round. They're eating the, the, and the honey they collect is to feed the, the workers through the winter to keep the hive warm and to keep the hive active. Um, and there's a queen in there that lives like six years in some cases. Um, whereas the bumblebees, they're, they're not at, and it, all of the rest of our native bees they're not active through the winter. They're sort of in torpor. They're hibernating underground or in a safe spot. Um, and because they're not active, they don't need that sugar source, which is the honey. So that the, they're really not collecting things other than honeybees aren't really collecting nectar for storage. They're collecting pollen for their offspring. And they're maybe mixing a little bit of nectar in to get the consistency right and to provide a little bit of sugar. But they're not making honey as we know it. Um, Bumblebees like maybe make a little bit of honey at sh certain times during the summer to f um, feed the queen that's underground, but um, it's not the not the honey hive that we're familiar with. Um, so, the, I think the biggest concern with honeybees in my mind is that they're a potential source for a lot of diseases that may jump into wild bees and even other insects in the broader landscape. I'll go through this fairly quickly, but this is a UVM study looking at deformed wing virus in honeybee colonies and in bumblebee colonies in the sur surrounding these honeybee colonies. And basically, the more deformed wing virus in the honeybee colonies, the more they found it in the bumblebees. And when there were no honeybees present on the landscape, they found no deformed wing virus in the wild bumblebees at that site. Um, how impactful the deformed wing virus is on wild bees is kind of an open question. I think it's certainly a problem for honeybees. Um, and then this wheel that is kind of crazy, hard to look at, but um, it's showing viruses and bacteria and fungus, I think, that have been documented both in honeybees and in other insects. So it's showing the, the possible spill between, like, this is bumblebees, and these are all of the different honeybee viruses and bacteria that have been documented in bumblebees. Um, and then it, it, all of these other things are other insects that have had spillover events documented. It includes things like lady beetles and grasshoppers and um, pretty unrelated uh, insects that are at least picking up, maybe not being inf affected by, but they're picking up things that are coming from honeybees or also present in honeybee hives. I can talk more about that at the end if we want, but for the sake of time, I'm going to move on. And this is this was sent to me from this is a, a, a press release. You don't have to read the whole thing, but from the Vermont Emergency Management Agency, just warning local police forces that there were uh, 14,000 honeybee hives that were arriving in Vermont in April of uh, 2022, and I think it's an annual occurrence where they're bringing in honeybee hives that have been probably maybe from as far away as California. They put them on a tractor trailer truck. They pollinate almonds in California for a month in February. They put them on a tractor trailer truck. They drive them to 
say, uh, North Carolina to pollinate blueberries for a month, and then they drive them up to Vermont and they put them out to pasture basically for the summer, where they're foraging on wild food to keep the hive alive, and then they'll use them for pollination the next summer. Um, and that, that's become a very large business nationally and globally even, because when you have 100,000 acres of almonds with no native bees present, um, you need to bring in bees to pollinate to get the fruit from almonds and apples and blueberries. There's a lot of things that honeybees are used for. But it happens in Vermont. I think mo there's maybe some people are bringing them in for apple orchards, but probably these are bees that have been used to pollinate crops elsewhere and are coming to Vermont sort of for the summer um, on tractor trailer trucks. All right, so back to my work with wild bees. Um, if you're at all interested, I encourage you to check out this report we put out last fall, the state of Vermont's wild bees. It's an interactive online web page um, with a lot more detailed information about conservation and um, the threats and the, what we do know and what we don't know about uh, bumblebees in Vermont, or wild bees in Vermont. Feel free to take a picture of this slide too if you want the, want the link. I never make them. <laughs> We're um, in the process of turning this information into a scientific uh, publication with, that'll have the full list of all the bees we know and, so, and the, the natural history that we've learned about um, the 350 species. Um, but for now, it's synthesized into this public report that came out last fall. Do all bees have stingers? All female bees have stingers. So male bees can't sting. So if you can tell them apart, you can, you can grab the male bees. <laughs> um, and right now, actually, most of the bumblebees that are still alive are males. Um, so it's a fun time to sort of, to, it's a little party trick to grab the male bees. Um, but also, a lot of the small bees aren't capable of breaking your human skin. So I'd say probably half of, even the half of the bees that have stingers, half of them can't sting effectively. So I, I, I'll hold them and I'll watch them try to like, try to poke with their stinger. And every once in a while they get under the nail and I feel it, but generally it's, the small ones are pretty harmless. Um, although some of the small ones I've al have also stung pretty painfully. Is this the case for some bees or are they all bees if they sting you, the, the stinger gets pulled out from like a wasp and they die? That's true. Uh, so the question was about insects or bees stinging people and the stinger getting removed, which is true for honeybees only. Honeybees have these barb stingers that pull out and kill the honeybee. And they, so they continue to pump venom after the bees die or been pulled out. All of the other bees, as far as I'm aware, they don't have barbs, they can sting and they can pull the stinger out and fly away. Um, which goes back to honeybees being these social animals where the workers are kind of expendable and they are trying to defend a colony. Whereas the solitary bees, they are the colony and if they die, they don't have any offspring. Um, so they're less likely to sting, and if they sting, they're generally okay. They're Did you actually, I'm sorry, I'm yeah. very curious. <laughs> I know bumblebees a lot in my garden, not as much as I used to. I mean, they're just absolutely so determined. I mean, they, they go after these flowers and like nothing gets yeah. in their way. And they're, and they're just like so focused. Yep. And so you wonder sometimes if you sort of just put your finger out whether they would sting you because you're interrupting them or they just sort of step up on your finger and keep on looking. You can, you can um, especially on cool mornings when they're not moving so fast, you can pet even the females. And they'll, sometimes they'll like stick a leg up in protest, but um, <laughs> I've never had them sting me doing that. <laughs> the only time I've ever been stung by bumblebees is like when I grab them in the net or when I step on them when they're feeding on clover or something. Um, or I put, like I put my, the other day, I put my hand on top of one that was on top of a fence post, and it stung me. But um, and if you're just watching them and they're, they don't have a nest to defend, they're, you're pretty safe. And how can you tell if they're male or female? The males are fuzzier. They, they have a like big yellow mustache and sort of a hairy belly. Um, they have 13 antenna segments instead of 12. <laughs> 13 antenna segments. <laughs> yeah which is not, not terribly helpful. <laughs> Takes some practice, but it, it's, it is doable. Uh, bumblebees oftentimes, I find that, 
And it doesn't have to be the end of the season, but you can just find bumblebees that, that are on a flower, but they're just not moving. They're very, very slow, yep. and, and it's almost like they're going to die. You think they're going to die and drop off, or they die right on the flower. But then you come back and they're gone. So bees I'm not sure what's going on with that. Bees in general, when it gets cold, they slow down. They're cold-blooded, so they slow down um, at night, and if they get caught out at night, they often find them sort of roosting, hanging underneath a flower, where they, um, especially in the fall, but it'll happen year-round, or all summer, um, on sunflowers and on Joe Pieweed. They'll sort of just tuck themselves underneath a protected spot and spend the night there. Um, and, which is, and the other thing, that, which is fun, if you have like a little vial, a Ziploc bag would work, but like a glass jar, you can catch a bee and put it in the fridge for five, 10 minutes, it'll slow down and you can dump it out and it'll take a few minutes for it to warm back up and you can get really good looks at it, take pictures of it, pet it if you want, um, and then they'll warm up and fly away. Just for the sake of time, I'm gonna jump through a few more slides um, and then I'm happy to stick around and take questions as long as people want. Um, so what can we do as, as citizens and as landowners, um, things to, that can help bees at the individual level. And I think bees are really great from a conservation standpoint because there are things that anybody can do that have direct measurable impacts. It's kind of hard to, to save mountain lions or wolves or um, all the African wildlife. There's not, there's not a lot that we can do as, as individuals other than maybe donating, but um, bees, there are things that you can do in your backyard, in your community, the local park that can make a big difference. Um, so native flowers, anything native is gonna be preferable to most of the garden cultivated, introduced, exotic species. These are the things that the native bees um, evolved with and they know how to handle. Um, and the, the, so like if you don't plant wild geranium, you're never gonna have the geranium bee. Um, and if there's, there's some European flower doesn't, is not gonna have any specialists here. So the native plants are higher bee diversity in general maybe with some exceptions, but uh, putting in a diversity of native, or encouraging a diversity of native flowers uh, is sort of the overarching, the goal. Um, limiting mowing, planting stuff, um, just encouraging plants that you find in your yard that you can identify as, as natives, goldenrods and asters, and um, mowing higher to let the, the violets and the wild strawberries bloom in your yard. These are all little things that are pretty easy. Um, and can make a difference. And then nesting habitat can be limiting in a lot of environments. Um, sandy soils are the highest diversity and density of nesting. So if you've got a sandy bank, maybe a stream erosion or the edge of a driveway where the vegetation is compacted, um, keep it like that. And, and don't try to have the lawn all the way up to the pavement. Leave, leave a little stretch of sort of bare marginal soil where the bees can nest, especially if it's sandy and there's no, sparse lawn is is often a good place for bees to get to the soil. A, a, a thick cover of tall grass makes it hard for them to access the nesting sites. Uh, and then for the species that nest above ground, things like brush piles um, and then the woody stems of sumac and raspberries and goldenrod, leaving those things as they are, even if it looks a little bit untidy, can make a big difference for, as nesting sites for, for these bees. Um, pesticides, I think, are, are a big problem in agricultural systems, but also at the, at the homeowner level. Um, there's a, it's pretty, it's easy to go to Home Depot and to buy the, the bug be gone or the, whatever the pesticide may be um, that is intended for a caterpillar that's eating your cabbage or something. But um, just, be, just be careful with them and watch for uh, things that might harm bees. Avoid spraying flowering plants. Um, and with, if you're buying plants into, as pollinator plants for your garden that have flowers of any sort, um, it's, it's hard, but, if, but try and watch out for treated plants. So a lot of plants are at the nursery are pre-treated with insecticides that basically make them toxic to any insects for, for several years after you buy them. Um, so if, you, if you're at the garden center, ask next time and see like, is this plant I'm about to buy gonna be poisonous to the bees for a few years? They might not know, I suspect they won't, but more and more there's, there are nurseries coming online that are aware of this and are trying to avoid um, treating. Mostly it's with neonicotinoids, which are these persistent pesticides that um, are really good at killing insects. Will systemic insecticides that are designed to kill animals that actually eat into the leaves of plants and flowers kill bees? 
Very likely, yes. The, um, they're eating the pollen, which is part of the flower, part of the plant, and can, has any of these systemic insecticides are expressed in the pollen. And if they don't kill the bee, they might have these sublethal effects where they make them confused, they, have a hard, they fly slower, they have a harder time finding their way back home. There's, a lot, there's lots of things short of killing the bees that have been shown to be problems with, insect, with neonicotinoids. Um, most of the research is with honeybees, but I'm sure it's happening with, with native bees as well. Um, and then or buying organic produce is, kind of, is, a, is an easy way to, to vote for um, organ, to limiting uh, insecticides in the environment and agriculture, uh, especially fruit. So a lot of the fruits, strawberries, blueberries, apples, they, to control various pests, they're spraying insecticides at the time of bloom, which is when the bees are on the flowers. Um, strawberries in particular, there's a tarnished plant bug that attacks the flowers and makes the fruit uh, less marketable. So they're spraying insecticides as the flowers are blooming, and they're certainly hitting bees then. Um, organic systems are generally safer and cleaner, although they're also spraying stuff as well. Um, and then a couple silly ones, maple syrup as preferred sweetener, um, a diverse sugar maple stand, has lots of flowering ephemerals, um, trout lily and spring beauty, and then and maybe wild geranium, and all of these associated spring, uh, spring ephemeral bees that are only in hardwood forests on those special flowers. It's also nesting sites for bumblebees. The maples themselves have flowers that are, can be really popular with bees on those first warm spring days. Um, and then venison, as a, as a way to keep the over-browsing and increasing deer populations under control. Um, especially in ex-urban areas, Chittenden County, deer populations, as far as I know, are, are increasing um, and are above the, the sort of the natural level of this ecosystem. They're, and they're preferring to browse on flowering buds and some of the woody shrubs that a lot of our bees like. Um, so there's a rhododendron specialist that is only on early azalea, which gets devoured by bees, um, or by, sorry, by plant gets devoured by deer and reducing the number of flowers that are available for bees. Um, dogwoods are another example where the deer do a number on them. Um, so keeping the deer population closer to natural levels is beneficial to bees, but also to, to birds and to other things that like an under, a thick understory in our forests. sort of very oversimplified, but this is what we're trying to avoid. Um, this is the sort of cottage garden full of nice, pretty flowers that um, are easy to maintain. Very few of those are native. Um, they're probably cultivated. They're chosen by humans for showy flowers. They might not have any pollen in them. Um, the, the classic example I like to give is the pollenless sunflowers that have been bred for for tables to not make a mess on the table because they don't have any pollen. They also don't have any food for the bees. Um, so that, that's kind of this garden example. There's, there's bumblebees there. They're visiting for nectar. Some of these generalists will show up in these kind of gardens. Um, but if instead, if those were all native plants, um, like this wild bergamot and swamp milkweed, you'd get both, you'd get the specialist bees. This is a wild bergamot specialist. that's only found on wild bergamot. And you'd also get the generalists that are visiting a lot of different flowers and that have evolved with these native plants. Oversimplified, but um, something to think about. And then on the back table on your way out, feel free to grab this. It's also on our website here, a different link. Um, it's my list of plants that I, I've recommended for either they support specialist bees, they're good nesting habitat, and or um, are pretty flowers that attract a variety of, of generalist bees. Um, and all the, there's little symbols that indicate deer resistance, specialist bees, um, and a few other things, some easy choices. So if you're at the garden center wondering what to find, you may be able to find some of these, although I don't know that they're all commercially available. Um, so that's the flowering one, and then I have a, also uh, for trees and shrubs. I think trees and shrubs are probably the what I would recommend that they're easier to maintain. You don't have to weed a wildflower strip. You can weed whack around the base of a dogwood or a, um, a choke cherry, and they, they flower with prolific flowers. A lot of these species for for whatever they're blooming. Um, and then
and then nesting habitat, there's bee hotels, and I'm just about out of time, so I won't talk about this much, but um, lots of things nest in stems, and in, you can make bee hotels. It's a good educational opportunity. It has its own drawbacks. Um, you can buy mason bees online to help pollinate your garden. I highly recommend you don't. Um, it's totally unregulated. They're coming from California, Washington, who knows where. You don't know what species of bee you're getting. They may have parasites. They may have par uh, fungus in them. Um, there's plenty of mason bees here. No need to buy them. And then now that I just told you to make your yard really messy, I probably should mention that ticks are a problem, especially <laughs> Richmond seems to be the, the center of the tick universe. Um, and the CDC would tell you to do the exact opposite of what I just told you to do. Um, I think there is a, there's a balance th to be struck where you can maintain a, a short grass for, around your uh, house to keep ticks at bay. Um, and then there's also, tick ecology is way complicated and um, I don't pretend to understand it all, but I think there's, there's something to be said that maintaining a native natural habitat if everyone did that, would reduce the larger tick population on the landscape. Um, ticks seem to do really well in honeysuckle and a lot of these invasive thickets that um, are not necessarily a natural part of the landscape. Um, and then ticks or deer are a big host for ticks and are changing in like the mesocarnivore coyote fox communities has impacts on the mice, which has impacts on the, both the ticks and in the Lyme disease that they carry. Um, so maybe this may work very well in your lawn, but I think if everyone did this, it might actually increase the tick abundance in the broader landscape because it changes the ecosystem further out of balance. I might be totally wrong on that, but it's something to think about. Um, oh yeah, and Japanese barberry is a great place for mice, great place for ticks. And then some links if you wanna take a quick picture. Uh, and then my last slide is just acknowledgments and thank you all for coming. I can hang out as long as people want for questions. Thank you so much, Ben, sir, for sharing all your research and your knowledge with us. Um, does anyone else have a question? Do the chicks bombs work for you? Do they take a toilet paper roll and stuff for cotton and Yeah. Yeah. So the question was about tick bombs, um, to basically toilet paper rolls full of insecticide targeting mice. Um, I don't have any firsthand experience with them, but logically, it seems like it should work, and it seems like it's fairly benign to everything else. I'm not worried. About, I mean, maybe there's some rare mice fleas that might be extinct, but it shouldn't have any, too many detrimental impacts on bees, depending on what the insecticide is. I should, I, should, I should note that bumblebees are really fond of nesting in old mouse nests. That's like their go-to spot. They really attra they're attracted to mouse urine, and that's where they tend to set up their nests. Um, so as long as the insecticide is not persistent, and if, it's, if you're thoughtful about when you put them out, it's probably a great way to keep ticks under control, or at least it's a better strategy than um, clearing your lawn or having someone spray a systemic insecticide across your lawn. Anyone else? Josh? I have a feeling this won't make any difference, but uh, theoretically, if one could eliminate um, the, uh, the honeybees from you know, your garden or yard, would it have would it have any practical effect on the uh, native bees? I think um, whether or not eliminating honeybees from a they lawn. Saw, like if right. you saw them and, you, and theoretically you exterminated them, would it have any effect, you know, on the native bee population? It's a worthwhile experiment. <laughs> <laughs> it, it might. Um, I think there's, there's enough honeybees on the landscape that it's probably impractical. Um, but it might, it'll reduce competition on flowers, which depending on the environment may or may not be problematic. Um, if there's enough flowers to go around, competition's probably pretty minimal. Um, and it might, it would reduce the increase of new diseases showing up and of like 
a, the source population for a lot of these diseases. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Just make sure I don't have anything else here. So what kind of camera do you use to get down inside <laughs> a bee's hole? And take it? It's a Canon um, D70. 100 millimeter macro lens. A little bit of patience. <laughs> a lot of patience. I, oh, some of these pictures I actually took with a magnifying glass attachment to my iPhone. So I, I, I like a little lens that clips on, and I just get, you can get up close that way. The problem with the phone lenses, the cameras, is they're not meant for insects, so they're trying to photo some of the background on the flowers, on whatever's behind it. So if you can get them to fo if you can trick them to focus on the bee, they can actually take decent photos. I'm sure some of these were taken with my phone. Um, and the, the macro lens definitely helps with the focus issue. Well, thank you all for coming. It's the middle of such a gorgeous day.